May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to a Cuke Audio phone chat. I'm your host, DC, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Doggett Bandita and Feline Cuchita, but without dear lovely Katrinka. Still trapped in America. Today's phone chat will be with Paul Rosenblum. He's the vice abbot of Johannes Hof Dharma Sangha in Germany, Richard Baker's uh, retreat there. He's an old Shinyu Suzuki student uh, and an old friend. And uh, he's had a pretty interesting uh, journey up to this point that uh, we're going to hear about. So he'll start at 20 minutes and 57 seconds. But before we go any further, it's time for Dear Dave. Tracy in Austin writes, Two questions. One, can you tell us about the evolution of Suzuki Roshi's name? I mean, what did folks call him at the time you knew him, and how did that change over time? Reverend Suzuki, Suzuki-san, Suzuki-sensei, sensei, Mr. Suzuki, question mark. Okay. So, uh, here's what I wrote back. Suzuki was called Reverend at first. Reverend Suzuki. When he arrived in 59. Uh, and then uh, Suzuki Sensei. You know, Sensei is just a word for anybody who's a teacher or a scoutmaster, you, you know, people would call me sensei when I was in Japan because I was teaching English. And they'd call him both. It's not like sensei replaced reverend. Maybe it was the, maybe it was the newer one or they, they felt it was more correct to call him sensei, but there were still people who'd been calling him reverend who just kept calling him reverend. And he would be called Suzuki Sensei or just Sensei. Uh, and let's see, I never heard him called just Reverend. It was Reverend Suzuki, Suzuki Sensei or Sensei. And then Suzuki Roshi or Roshi. And oh, hey, his wife would call him Hojo san, which is very normal. It's a very appropriate way to address a priest in their temple in Japan, Hojo-san. It's, it's a, a term meaning the abbot of this temple, uh, Mr. Ten Square Feet. It's translated as sometimes in jest because it refers to the traditional small area that the uh, priest of a temple would have for his personal space. Oh, and um, his uh, sister in Japan would refer to him sometimes as Toshi, which is Shunju. Uh, shun, Toshi, Toshi Taka was the, the Japanese pronunciation of Shunju. Shunju was the Chinese type pronunciation of those terms, the more formal pronunciation. So when he was a kid, he was called Toshi, which is short for Toshitaka. 
So uh, uh, in in uh, some of her interviews or in talking to her in Japan, she sometimes would refer to him as Shunyu and sometimes as Toshi, which is what she called him when they were growing up. So it's just a, a, a polite term. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they were calling him Roshi. Every once in a while, uh, I, I'd see it in uh, in wind bells, early wind bells. But it, 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 the, uh, the, calling him Suzuki Roshi didn't become the standard that everybody started ca calling him, all the new people, and... Most of the people there that time uh, didn't that didn't happen until the fall of 1966, while he was in Japan, right right at the time that I arrived, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, Alan Watts wrote a letter to the Zen Center saying it was not proper for uh, him to be called uh, Reverend Suzuki. And I've never seen that letter. I, you know, I don't. I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, and I, I went through all of Zen Center's archives. Uh, the little bit there was of it. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they were, you know, everybody was into the era. Now it never occurred to them any anything would be that important. But there were some things saved, and most of the lectures survived, or many of them survived. Uh, but uh, Watts, you know, took issue for, with the meaning of reverend and calling a, a Japanese Zen priest reverend. Uh, and uh, and he called Suzuki a, a Zen master and said he should be referred to as Roshi. Um, so when Suzuki came back from Japan, uh, he was told that and he got a big laugh out of it. <laughs> and, uh, but people started calling him that. Suzuki Roshi, this, Suzuki Roshi, that, and then just Roshi, Roshi. Thank you, Roshi. Um, and, uh, but some of the older students still would call him Suzuki Sensei or Reverend Suzuki or refer to him, and even some of the newer ones picked that up from the older ones as a sort of, you know, old-fashioned style. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, when I was uh, in Japan talking to uh, people about him, they would refer to him I mean, people who knew him, people in the eyes of where his temple was, people who revered him, would refer to him as Suzuki-san. I, I don't know how widespread the idea of calling a priest sensei is. Um, well, it's just a term of respect. But they just would call him Suzuki-san. Roshi is a sort of inside temple type term. So, all right. That is my answer to question number one. And number two, oh, incidentally, he says, Dear David, not Dear Dave, which I do not like. Um, oh, and, and he says, I am thoroughly enjoying the Crooked Cucumber podcast. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, Tracy. All right, number two. Did do the sales of crooked cucumber make you rich? <laughs> okay, that's an immodest question. <laughs> he says, what I really want to know is, what are the book sales like, numbers sold, and do they provide you with much of an income? How does it come to you, like a dime per book or what? I have no idea about such things. Okay. Uh, so I, I got a sizable advance for Crooked Cucumber back in the mid-1990s. And that was extremely helpful. I spent a great deal making it, you know. Uh, I mean, I spent uh, probably $15,000 on translations, you know. And I went to Japan and... 
uh, no, I, I don't know how much I spent doing it. I spent $10,000 promoting it after it came out. And that's just counting, I'd say, most of the promotional costs that I underwrote. I put a lot into it. Uh, most of my energy was put into <laughs> writing it and working on it. And incidentally, I was a year late. Uh, the, the contract had to be rewritten. But, uh, you know, I would just... It had its, its own momentum. I mean, at one point, uh, I was advised, all right, come on, get it together. You know, you can finish it right now. Just get into a blaze of work and do it. I went, all right, I'll do it. And I immediately stopped everything and spent a month or so. I, I don't remember how long, but it was a long time. Just reading his lectures and thinking about all that. So, I mean, you know, it took time. All right. So, uh, after uh, the, the, the last... Uh, the last check I received mm, was when it went into paperback. It came out in 1999. It was paperback in 2000. That's the last money I received for it. Because And how many copies has it sold? I do not know. Uh, and it, it's been translated in uh, German and just recently, uh, last year, 2019, November, in Japanese. Uh, and uh, it was published in England, but that went out of print pretty quick. Anyway, and then, uh, um, uh, you know, it never paid back its advance, you know. Uh, an advance is advance on your future royalty. So I've never received anything. And uh, I put a lot of time into the one a couple of years. I mean, not full time, but I put a lot of time into the one that came out in Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, my, you know, I didn't get anything for that. Uh, but, you know, I, what I say, I consider, uh, you know, uh, writing to be pro bono. Now, I got a pretty good advance for Zenith right here from Broadway also. But they, that went out of print like a year or two later. I don't know how So Maybe a few years later. I, I don't remember. And that was my fault. I was, I was involved with a, um, a, a sort of puppy love uh, affair. My wife and I had broken up. And, well, we... We separated and lived together for a year and a half after that. It wasn't like anything unexpected. But after she moved out, after having been separated for a year and a half, I did a little dating, which was fun. And I had this wonderful relationship that I just loved. And mm, that was happening right when that book came out. And let me tell you, uh, I... I just didn't put anything into promoting it. I just, you know, I was blinded by love. I was blinded by infatuation. <laughs> all right. So, um, and all right. But, you know, to me, it's like I said, it's pro bono. Like the uh, 50th anniversary version of Zen Mind Beginners Mind just came out with an afterword by me. Uh, and I, I put pretty good time into that afterward, but I didn't get anything for that. Now, I might have if I'd asked, but I thought if they wanted to give me something, they could. But I, I know why they didn't, because I got paid for the, for, for the afterward for the 40th, and this was just an update. However, it was a serious update that reflected, you know, 10 years of working in this area and having unique information. Uh, but that's all right. It's, I'm not grumbling. I'm just telling you, I live on donations. 
And I do get a little money from publishing. But, uh, boy, I'll tell you, it's sure not enough to live on. <laughs> but, hey, who knows? Maybe, uh, um, maybe the next book, there's one coming out next year. Zen is, uh, the, the sequel to Zen is right here, <laughs> coming out 20 years later, literally. <laughs> 2021. <laughs> and it'll be a, uh, a companion book to Zen is right here. But right now, the working title is Zen is right now. Uh, and, and they're going to come out as hardback together as a set. Uh, Zen is right here. It's going to be republished. It's got a little, I made a few little changes in it here and there. Nothing you'd notice. And, but they'll also be available separately. So, um, and I'm working on another book and I've got others in mind, but you know, I get involved in these projects and I just don't get to them, to it much. I mean, I'm, I'm well along. I'm, I'm rounding the final, the final lap. Uh, for Tatsara stories, but I just can't get to it right now because of working on these podcasts. Uh, but um, all right, so uh, that's <laughs> that's your answer on that. And well, uh, you know, uh, I don't think you're supposed to talk about how much you got you get for an advance for. Uh, uh, a book, but I'd say that the advance I got for the one that's coming out next year is, is very small, uh, but that, I didn't care. It didn't bother me because if it sells, then I'll receive money after that advance is paid off. And let me tell you, these days you should be grateful you're getting p published, not complain about your publisher. Uh, that's how I feel about articles too I don't write articles I mean I've written a few articles but I avoid them uh, but somebody called me up and was all upset because an article they had written for a tricycle or somebody uh, that was edited and they edited out stuff they thought was important I said oh yeah sure that's that's what happens I edit out your favorite stuff I said, just be grateful you're being published. Look, now we've got the Internet. You can put it on the way you like it on the Internet. That's what I do. Uh, I've done that a few times. Okay. There's one more question from Zaviara in Tierra del Fuego. And Zaviara asks, what's that creaking noise going on in the background? Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I have to be still when I read. And I, I do it when I read the chapters of Crooked Cucumber. But I just get lax and other stuff. And I've got to do something. I, you know, I sit on this rattan chair, and it's very comfortable. But if I move, it creaks. Here, sorry. Uh, yeah, that must be distracting. Look, I'll, I'll do something about that. Well, that's the conclusion of today's episode of uh, Dear Dave, which I haven't done for a while. So, um, okay, let's have uh, a pause to meditate and then go right into uh, Mr. Paul Rosenblum. So... When you hear the bell, I suggest you hit pause and then meditate or some facsimile, including doing nothing, including not meditating, uh, whatever you wish, for as long as you wish. And when you are through with that, say, when you are refreshed, <laughs> pardon me, I ruined it, <laughs> uh, uh, hit unpause, and then we'll call Paul. Hey, that sounds like a TV show. Uh, all right. So seriously, when you hear the bell, hit pause. 
when you're through hit and pause, we'll hit another bell then, and then we'll go right in to talking with Paul Rosenblum. David. Yes. David Chadwick. Hello, David Chadwick. How are you? David, I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? Okay. Hey, let me ask you something, all right? Dear David, where are you? Bali. How are you? Yeah, good. But may I, uh, I wanted to ask you something. Sure. I'm gonna, I want to do a podcast with you. I just want you to tell your story. What story? And say anything else. What story is that? Uh, well, um, could I start recording you? Do you mean like now? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is possible. All right. Um Hey, so how are you doing? <laughs> David, in a, in a uh, eerie and uh, incomprehensible way, wonderfully. Yeah. Quite good. Yeah. And I'm in a little, I'm in a marine bubble. Yeah, what's it like there? It's been, uh, you know, I've been self-isolating. Yeah at the suggestion of my doc and uh, have had very little contact with uh, people in person, but a lot of intimate contact with people online. Yeah. And it's been quite wonderful. Mm. And uh, slowed down in a way. Uh, my mornings are mostly practice now. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, which includes, because of my connection with the Sangha in Germany, meetings with some students online and meeting with the uh, Sangha teachers online in Germany, mm -hmm. and meeting regularly with Baker Karoshi online, mm -hmm. and uh, more sitting and study and uh, expansiveness and radiance. Very grateful. Mm. So... In the midst of the not disconnected from it, in the midst of how much suffering and distress there is, uh, feeling how important it is for me to continue to anchor uh, life in this upright zazen practice. Mm. That's how I, that's how I've been. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, when was the last time you were in Germany, at at uh, Johannes Hof? Uh, I would say in uh, early February, mm -hmm. I went from there to uh, practice with the Sangha in Vienna, mm. and then uh, making a seminar in outside of Munich, uh -huh. and we haven't been back to Europe since then, and I don't, I really don't know when I'll return. When you say we? Oh, well, Gene, Gene and I did a seminar together Oh, at a... Uh, seven, we do one year, one seminar a year, our annual joint seminar at a place called Zist, and it's become a, a great event for us, and we have a, a wonderful following, you know, mm -hmm. 50 to 60 people come each year to be with us, so it's, it's great. Mm -hmm. And I do uh, Zazen with people, and Jean does her teaching of the Diamond Approach with people. 
Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's a great, great event for us. Uh, but so that's the us. And Jean often goes with me to Europe, and I've been there, maybe you know, I've been there more than six months each year now. More than six months, wow. Yeah. yeah. So it's really, you know, I'm feeling the separation from the, uh, the daily practice there. And, uh, you know, question my, I have this baker, she kindly invited me to be something called the vice abbot. So we have two vice abbots. And I still don't know what it means. It's been a couple of years now. You are not, Mark. With, yeah, but, you know, feeling, well, I don't know, how, how can I do this from California? And, but uh, I feel very connected and present there. Almost, not every day, but most every day I have some connection with Europe online. Mm. Mm. Well, I like it there. Hey, David, we like you there. <laughs> Yes, really. I'll never mm -hmm. forget the first time that you came. How wonderful it was! And your and your first uh, talk with us, and you learned to say "meine Freund." Uh -huh. Everybody was just so pleased and so happy to be with you. And and you also your your legend preceded you, but you did not fail your legend, David. Oh, <laughs> I can't remember anything but just. Being there and everybody, I, I mean, I really like it. Really good well, people. Very, very, you know, my my general feeling, maybe it's because it's the particular Germans I know. They just seem so unneurotic compared to Americans. <laughs> well, they have their own kind of neurosis, maybe. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I can say that people really appreciated it. Uh, you and your presence and the way you practice. So it was great having you. Oh, well, you have gee. to come back. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like Please. to. Uh, Please. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, Paul, how did you get into all this? Hey, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I had my midlife crisis at four. <laughs> and I realized everything my parents were telling me. And it was very clear the moment that it happened. Gesundheit. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I was standing in my the pantry of our kitchen in our house on Long Island. Mm -hmm. in my, it was the fall because, I think it was the fall because of the light, the slant of the light. And I was in my blue corduroy bib overalls. And I was in the pantry, and I said, I am all alone. Everything that they're telling me is not true. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I felt lost for years and began, uh, when I was at the university, to study Buddhism. And the, the introduction to it was I saw a photograph in something called Horizon Magazine. Do you know that? Or it's not a magazine, it's a quarterly it was a hardcover it. quarterly. Yeah, it was very uh, high quality. Beautiful, beautifully done. And I saw a picture of a monk, which I didn't know where Ryokan was, who it, uh, Ryoanji was at the time. But it was a monk sitting, looking at the garden, and it was a photograph from his back. And I'd seen photographs of, you know, JFK walking with, uh, Bobby Kennedy and from the back and you kind of know who it is and it means something to you but I'd never seen a photograph from the back of somebody that I didn't know that impacted me so and I felt in the midst of what I was doing at the university I needed to find out what that was what so university? I started studying the uh, University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Fine. so I started studying academically I started studying Buddhism I studied Sanskrit and was going to be a Buddhist scholar. And I heard that there was a Zen group in Philadelphia where Mickey Stunkard practiced, and you remember Mickey. Well. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I went to Mickey's office, and he, he was willing to see me for a, a less than, a, it might have been three minutes. 
and uh, I remember his office was uh, filled with books, and there was one photograph above his desk of a tiny little, I didn't know what it was at that time, but it was a Japanese teacher coming down the gangplank of uh, one of those old prop airplanes. And uh, so Mickey looked up at me and I said, I heard that there's a place where I can learn to practice Zen meditation. And he put a piece of paper in the typewriter because obviously there were no computers then. This was in the uh, 1960s. And typed out, I think it was 1710 or 1706 or whatever, it was Locust Street, and just handed me the piece of paper and dismissed me. <laughs> and I think was quite surprised that I actually showed up. And I began sitting with the Zen Studies Society Philadelphia group, which was affiliated with Edo Roshi in Zen what Studies year? Society in New York. This was in uh, 1968. Uh huh. And I thought, you know, gee, I mean, if I do this for a little while, I'm going to be enlightened and I'll be a really good scholar. <laughs> so I thought, oh, gee, you know, so what I what I should do, be, this is between my junior and senior year at Penn. And I thought, OK, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to. Japan, and I'm going to go to a Japanese monastery, and I'm going to get enlightened, and I'm going to be this fantastic scholar. Uh, but I didn't speak Japanese. I've just been studying Sanskrit, which didn't work in Japan very well. So uh, I heard about this place called Tassahara. The leader of our group, a woman named Shirley Tassencourt, who was, uh, and I expect if she's still alive, is was a exceptionally luminous being, a radiant being, mm. uh, a student of Yasutani Roshi. Mm. And I had an, an insight somewhat into her practice because Yasutani Roshi had written her poems and I brought them to one of my teachers at Penn to translate them. And he said, who is this person <laughs> that is the subject of these poems? Uh, Shirley was she was quite an amazing person anyway so Shirley recommended that I go to Tassahara and sent a letter to a man named Dick Baker mm. and Dick Baker said he hasn't been sitting long enough he can't go to Tassahara however and you were at Tassahara then by the way you were in the dining room the head of the dining room at the first summer that I was there and but however they ended up they needed somebody in the kitchen and they were willing to accept me to go to Tassahara in spite of Dick Baker's reluctance, Richard Baker's reluctance. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the summer of 68, I went to Tassahara and uh, worked in the kitchen. Lenny Brackett was the head of the Zendo, maybe you remember. He was the head of the Zendo cooking crew. Ed and Alan Winter were doing the guest cooking. Oh, yeah. And Clark, and Clark was doing the guest cooking, and you were the head of the dining room. Mm -hmm. uh, Clark anyway, was doing Tassahara. guest cooking then. Wow, I forgot that. Yeah, Alan Winter and Ed did it, and then Clark Mason also helped somehow. Yeah, yeah. In that tiny little, I guess it had become the tea kitchen, but that tiny little kitchen that we had behind what is. I don't even know if it's there anymore. No, it's 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 not there. There's other things there that are, you know, there's a, a dish shack down below. And that in the summer, that is a much bigger uh, uh, building now. Uh, I mean, it's just a wooden structure, I'd say, maybe uh, 20 by 25. And it's used uh, for storage and making bag lunches. There's a whole work area in there. Got it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but this was, but you remember that original tiny kitchen. Well, of course. Good Lord. For both the Zendo meals and the, and the uh, guest meals. So anyway, I, I spent that summer, and then I went back to Penn, and I realized I'm going to learn a lot more from spending some time with Suzuki Roshi than I am getting a Ph.D., which was my plan. I was going to go to Columbia 
and get a PhD, joint PhD between Union Theological Seminary and Columbia in Buddhist studies. And it was a great, my Sanskrit teacher had come from Columbia, and they at that time, uh, Columbia and Wisconsin, and I'm very dated because I'm not familiar with what's going on now, but those were the two best places to go uh, for Buddhist studies at that time. And so I was going to study Sogdian and Cotonese, which were these ancient Iranian languages, and translate these texts that maybe still have never been translated, that were landlocked through trade routes. So this was going to be this forefront of Buddhist scholarship, and my teacher was going to launch me in this Buddhist scholar career. And I thought, well, you know, wait a second. Why don't I just go spend some time with Suzuki Roshi? <laughs> I'm going to learn something I'm never going to learn at the university with you, and I can come back if I want. And they were, they were uh, accepting and willing for me to do that. So I finished at Penn and then went to Tassajara and just ended up staying. And uh, one of the most wonderful experiences in my life is being with Suzuki Roshi. It still remains so. Uh, and, uh, yeah, can you elaborate? To inform. Pardon? Excuse me? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, I think what, when I first met him, when I first went to Tassajara, I was immediately impressed with, uh, we called him Chino Sensei at that time, Coben. Yeah. And I could relate to Coben, and I could relate to his struggle and his difficulty, and he was completely out front with, you know, which you remember all the difficulties that he went through, which were no, no presumption, no, I'm a teacher or a priest, and I don't have any problems. And, I mean, I remember once he stayed in his room for a month. I mean, he was just... He'd fall asleep. You remember in the summer, he'd fall asleep during his own lectures. <laughs> I mean, he was, I remember, David, I remember when you poured hot tomato soup on him. Well, I didn't in pour it. I Zendo. spilled it. <laughs> yes, you did. And he just <laughs> smiled. You know, he obviously was scalded. It's all over his ocasa. Anyway, I was so impressed with him. And Suzuki, actually, I just couldn't get I know, the first experience I had with Suzuki Roshi, I was, we were having, you know, the tea in the afternoon, the tea break during afternoon work. And I was telling somebody, because I was translating, no, Garjan at that time, I was translating the Mula Majamika Karika Shastra. And I was telling somebody about how important this was for me and how I was exploring this concept of emptiness and I was trying to figure out what this meant in my meditation practice and what it had to do with Zen and all stuff. And I didn't know Suzuki Roshi was behind me. And the first thing he ever said to me was, he said, and I'm this like 19, 20 year old college kid, right? Mm -hmm. And the first thing he said to me was, he said, oh, you, you must give me a lecture on that. <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> what is this? And I couldn't really relate to him. It was just too, it was like, how do you relate to the sky is compassionate? It just it was beyond me. Uh, but I finished Penn, and rather than going to graduate school, I went back to Tassajara. And this was in the summer of 69. And uh, I felt... Uh, I had some experiences in the summer of 68 with him. But the summer of 69, pretty much for me, and I, I feel for him as well, solidified our practice relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly Rohatsu Sashin that year and Shosan ceremony at the end of the Rohatsu Sashin. So I felt he had... Uh, implicitly accepted me as his student and I had taken him as my teacher. And uh, it was made explicit for me in that Shosan ceremony. So uh, I ended up staying at Tassahara. And he uh, there were five of us uh, he wanted us to go and 
study at, uh, to, to live at Rinso Inn. It was Rev Dan Bill Shirtliff, one other person, I forget who it was. And Hoitsu san really was not so keen on <laughs> building this space at Rinso Inn. I don't think he was so keen on getting up every day and sitting with these <laughs> yeah, back young then, Americans. And, back then, no way. No, he wasn't so he wasn't so keen on that. And it didn't it didn't work out, but Suzuki Roshi had hoped uh, be, because I was the one of the five of us that didn't want to go. I didn't want to go to Japan. Mm. And I was not, as you were, uh, or the others were, I was not ordained by him. I received uh, Jukai. I didn't receive Tokido. And But he said, because you don't want to go to Japan, I want you to go to Japan. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. I said to him, I just want to stay with you. And he said, I can't take care of you now the way I want. So he had arranged with me to go to study with Niwa Roshi wow. at Eheiji Betsuin. And he wanted me to study Dogen at Komazawa University. This was the idea. I'd live at Eheiji Betsuin. Uh, I'd live with Niwa Roshi, who would train me. And I'd study Dogen. And uh, as these plans were in play, and I was at Kasar in the summer of 71, something like this, my father died mm. uh, October 29th. Mm. I remember it was a four and nine day. Mine died on uh, October 30th. Mm. Mm. Oh, wait a minute. Are there 31 days in October? Yeah, 31st. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I ended up leaving Tassahara, and then uh, that December, beginning of Rohatsu Sushin she died. Mm. And Niwa Roshi subsequently became the vice abbot of Eiji, and what is he going to do with this 22-year-old, you know, <laughs> scruffy American kid, mm-hmm. <laughs> gung-ho, Zen practitioner, Security design from what's he gonna do with me? So it it never came to pass. But my feeling is still my the the, the ability that I have uh, to study and understand Dogen is uh, completely. And I mean every day. I mean I have in front of me. I have King of Samadhi Zamo Zamayo Zamai in front of me now. So I study Dogen most every day. Something. Mm. Uh, as the the impulse I feel from Suzuki to do this, to find a way to uh, understand and help uh, help mm. us understand again. Mm. Anyway, so I, I stayed at Tassahara for a while, went back and lived in the city, went back to Tassahara, and it's been about nine years at Zen Center. And had my separations, my partings with Baker Roshi, feeling of uh, so many people uh, were so supportive of what he was doing, and I felt separated from what he was doing. And at that time, I had been a director at Green Gulch, I'd been his Jisha, I'd been somebody he gave permission to lecture at Green Gulch on Sundays. And I felt How were you, something were you was ordained that. at that point? I, I, Baker Roshi had ordained me. Yeah. So I received Tokido from Baker Roshi, not from. I received Jukai from Suzuki Roshi in seventy. I'm trying to think. I don't remember the year, David. I'm seventy-one, sorry. maybe. Maybe seventy-one. It was one of those? Not the first Jukai. He did the second. It was a large, maybe twenty-five people, thirty people. Well, the first one was in sixty-two. And the second one was in 70, and the third was in 71. I think it was the third one then. Yeah. It was after we had Page Street. I remember, I also have this fond memory of which you were the work leader. 72. And I I remember we had. If you're talking about. Are you talking about Page Street? Page Street. At 72. 
because I remember we had this wonderful kind of grand reception room with a fireplace to the right uh, as you uh, entered into the building from the entryway. And Suzuki, she said, we should make this into a Buddha hall. Oh. And you, and I remember you were the work leader. Is that no, not correct? No, no, no. I was, I was not in the building while he was alive. I was at Tassajara. Why well, don't I? Well, somehow I credit you in my my heart, David. I credit with you, with saying yes, we should do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we converted this room, and I was working in a cabinet shop at the time with Jim Morton and Rick Morton and John Welke, and Suzuki Yoshi made the design for an altar, that funny kind of lotus-like, uh, the redwood background with the pine framing, which I think still is there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we made that at our cabinet shop and made that Buddha Dharma Hall. So that's the, that's the, uh, the hall that I received the Jukai in. Ah, but I, would you tell me the uh, name of the uh, cabinet shop, the, t uh, the man there? The furniture was... by Gaddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> his name, the cabinet maker was named Rich Gaddy, and it was all his instance, and it was the four of us and Rich, and it was a fantastic experience for me, wonderful experience. Yeah. This was not something, I mean, for my family for me to work with my hands <laughs> was just incomprehensible, you know. <laughs> Your family uh, was into business machines. Yeah, business. They were, you know, business department store. My father had several department stores. Rosenblum's? Yeah. Yeah. He used to advertise for the uh, on the uh, professional football games at that time were Saturday afternoon. Mm-hmm. And my father is one of the advertisers for professional football on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> wow, cool. It was cool. But so anyway, so, you know, for, for my father to be a Buddhist scholar was a stretch, but acceptable if I was going to have a Ph.D. and be a professor. And it was OK. It was a little bit, you know, a, a, uh, a spin on Stendhal's Red and Black. You know, my brother went into the family business and I was going to be a scholar. That was somewhat acceptable. Mm -hmm. But this Buddhist stuff was, this was a stretch. And then the fact that I would do something working with my hands, this was just, it just, it just couldn't imagine it. But anyway, mm -hmm. so I, I had, this was a, a wonderful, and I still am grateful for that time, mm -hmm. for his instruction and his his patience with me teaching me but so we in our cabinet shop we made that altar which i think is still under the gondoran buddha at page street mm -hmm. uh, excuse me not I, I believe it is still under the buddha mm -hmm. at page street and it was and it was designed by sizkiroshi which made it that made it important for me and fit perfectly and i don't think people even know that that's a fireplace <laughs> I've forgotten. I mean, I was there when, um, you know, now and then I'd be there. I'd forgotten. I, 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 I was there, you know, visiting before that was all fixed. Uh, but it was David, done pretty I could, quick. I could misremember it, but I just remember you had this let's get it done energy, and we just painted the space. Took all the furniture out. Well... It might have been when there was a uh, an interim at Tassar or something like Possible, that. Possible, but you don't recall that. Anyway, I recall you being uh, an energy and a force behind making that happen. Wow. All right. Well. So, uh, David, it's just an expression of my esteem for you, that's all. Oh, well, goodness. <laughs> I blush. <laughs> Your importance for our song. Anyway, I'm 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 willing to spend my uh, my praise relentlessly for you. It's not a problem. Oh wow! Well, thank you very um, much. <laughs> so, uh, 
I spent some time at Tessahara and uh, at Page Street and at Green Gulch and decided, you know, I I just needed to do something else. I wasn't, I didn't feel a certain kind of accord with Baker Oshie and what he was doing and how Zen Center was developing. But you and were, you were Shuso, you were Ed Monk at Tassahara. I, I had been Shuso and I had been lecturing at Green Gulch. I was his, I was director at Green Gulch <laughs> on and off for five years. And there was a board meeting. Ed Satizan was president of Zen Center at that time. And I had told Baker Roshi, I said, I want to leave. And it wasn't like we had an argument or, and he said to me, I want you to wait for one year before you leave. And I said, that's okay for me. I can do that. But it's clear. So we had a, a, a council, it was called a council, if you remember then. We had a council. Oh, yeah, that's right. And so Baker said to Ed, if you could pick anybody in Zen Center, you know, we need a vice president. Who would you have be your vice president? So he said, I want Paul to be my vice president. And Baker, she basically said something like, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> Paul wants to leave Zen Center. So this was six months into my one year. And I was pretty annoyed uh, because... I didn't have a chance to talk to people or make this public or make this understood. Uh, but so he basically forgave me the one year and let me leave after six months. And uh, rather than he had sort of assumed I would go back and work in my family's business in New mm -hmm. York. Uh, but I ended up going and working uh, for Jerry Brown and the Brown administration. Right. You became and like this, his, uh, you know, you were very close to him. You were like his assistant, him and Jacques. Yeah, I was, my, my title, I, Jacques was the director of administration, and my title was deputy director of administration. Mm -hmm. But I had, uh, yeah, and I still have a good, close relationship with Jerry. I appreciate him very much. Uh, so... I do, too. Uh, you know that. Yes, I know you do. And he is... Um, it's funny, he's still guiding me in some, <laughs> some strange way. He's telling me I, I should not go back to Europe until there's a vaccine. And I kind of am listening. I'm a doc isn't as explicit about it, but I think Jerry has information not just from the medical side, but from the socio-political side. Uh, but I'm, I'm reluctant. I'm very reluctant to get on a plane, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I'm feeling now, until there's something is there clear. A, is there a particular reason why you are reluctant to get on a plane? Oh, yes. Excuse me. So I've been... I, I'm a bleeder. I have hemophilia C. So I'm uh, immunocompromised, they say. But yeah. the other thing is, speaking with my hematologist, it's pretty clear that if the hospitals start to fill up, uh, they can't intubate me. Uh, the idea of doing a tracheostomy or a tracheotomy is just, they can't, just can't do it uh, because of the blood issue. Yeah, and so the the difficulty in treating me and I mean, for an example, maybe you know, I had my knee replaced. I mean, I wore my knees out, and I had one of my knees replaced. And my hematologist, who's a saint, who's my neighbor, felt he couldn't take care of me in Marin, so arranged for me to uh, be under the care of a hematologist at Stanford. And it's an operation. Many people stay overnight. They get out the next day. You know, they do the knee. I mean, it's, it's kind of like carpenters. You know, they cut and saw and paste and put it back together and send you out. Oh, so I had yeah. to stay in the hospital for five days. Yeah. And they oh, monitored yeah. me every two hours. Yeah. My blood. And then I had to go to Marin General on an outpatient basis for a week after that to get transfusions. So, I mean, before I go to the dentist, I have to, sometimes, 
I have to go to the hospital and get blood. So if something happens to me, because there is no treatment, and the treatment is ultimately, if I get really sick, is to intubate me or to do a tracheostomy or a tracheotomy, hey, he's, he's, he's just not going to do it for me. I mean, my hematologist basically said, you know, they're just going to leave. I'm, I'm the one that's going to be left in the gurney in the hall, okay? Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that wouldn't be nice. Um, hey, you know what this reminds me of? The most incomprehensible thing about you. Didn't you get into boxing? Well, yeah. yeah. When I was in prep school, I started to box. And I boxed for about three years. And what was interesting Jesus. is that you know, I had trouble with bleeding. Uh, but it was, it's gotten worse as I've gotten older. They've tested this factor oh. in my blood. Oh. Factor 11. But they used to, this, I had this guy named Broadway Megat who was one of the trainers, mm -hmm. and he would take a swab, stick it in silver nitrate, and then burn the inside of my nose to help me to stop bleeding. Mm. So this is why I have that funny nose, which I have earned. Mm. <laughs> I actually had my nose fixed at a certain point because I couldn't breathe out of one side of the, you know, my, my bridge had been crushed. But I told them I don't want them to fix my. I said I earned my nose. Don't fix my nose and make it look nice. Uh huh. Good. Good. <laughs> so I have this mug now. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I did. I did box, and they didn't. And and I bled. My my bleeding was exceptional, but it it wasn't uh, alarming at that point. But what I found is, as they've tested my blood over time, as I've gotten older. I've had less and less of this factor to the point that it basically doesn't exist in my blood anymore. Mm. And less than 80% is supposed to be dangerous. So it's, mm. anyway, that's, so it's something I am I'm taking care of and I'm careful with. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness. Um, be careful. <laughs> you are careful. I, I try to be. <laughs> I, I take, yes, I take care of. So where were we when I uh, diverted you uh, with that? Anyway, so I went and worked in Sacramento. Oh, yeah. And uh, after I left, after, after the administration ended, my, my job ended, you know, I had these funny job offers, being vice president of an airline, being vice president, which went under, by the way. Mm -hmm. a regional airline, being vice president of an insurance company. I didn't want to do any of these things. So I ended well, up... Wait, uh, you you were treasurer of the Democratic Party of California for a while, right? That was late. I was finance director. Yes, that was after. That was later. Uh -huh. That was when Jerry became chair of the Democratic Party. He asked me to be finance director. Uh -huh. um, but so I ended up through twists and turns, uh, started talking to people about what I might do that would be of interest to me. And I ended up being a consultant, developing a consultant practice to nonprofits to help uh, communities at risk uh, develop businesses, employment opportunities for people. Homeless people, ex-offenders, drug addicts, runaway kids, uh, people with mental disabilities, things like that. Mm. I did that for a while, and then I ended up being, and then Jerry asked me to be finance director of the Democratic Party, which I did. Uh, and then from that, I segued into, I had a business for a while. I remember that. What was that? You were you were buying containers. Exactly, had... brokering food. Uh huh. And I started. I went to a session, the first session. I think it was 1989 at Creston. Mm -hmm. And I st I hadn't been willing to be Baker a student. <laughs> uh, I felt too much was unsettled in him. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did want to sit seen, session with him, and I and I continue to practice relationship with him. And uh, it the 
uh, encouragement from him, I started to work with nonprofits again, not just buying and selling and brokering food and making, you know, just a, a business to make money. Mm-hmm. And that was helpful to me because it was, you know, I mean, it was the same conversation. It was, you know, a lot of telephone, at that time, fax machines Mm -hmm. and making deals. And it just was, I mean, it was a way for me to earn some income and I'm great. And I'm, you know, I have, I'm I'm living the benefit of that, which I'm grateful for. Gave me some freedom. Uh, But the work was intrinsically unsatisfying. Mm-hmm. So the activity, you know, being in contact with my life, my breath, body, and phenomena was satisfying. But the content of my activity was not intrinsically satisfying. And Baker, she encouraged me to do something with people and others. And so I started to do more nonprofit consulting and working with a museum project and different you know, different things. So, What's and the museum I, project? It was a museum for biodiversity. Somebody... Uh, a member of a prominent family in America had been very committed to biodiversity and asked me if I would help to create a museum. So I ended Ooh. up being kind of the... I don't want to get into the name. You would know the name. Um, and so... It was through politics and what happened in San Francisco, and there were several acres on the Embarcadero we were supposed to get... Willie Brown, was, who was the mayor at that time, was supportive of it. Some of the supervisors were not. We got caught in a political flim-flam, and the project is segued into something that exists at the Smithsonian and uh, else, uh, elsewhere locally uh, throughout the country. So it's, something good has happened, but not what we had originally envisioned. Mm-hmm. Um, Sounds so like a lot of work. It was, it was a lot of work, and it was, but it was wonderful work. And to do something about, you know, insects and pollinators and things that people overlook that are so essential to our well-being and to the well-being of the planet, it was it felt very good work. Mm. I'm grateful for it. Yeah, thanks. Good for you. But it was not, it was not, it was this, you know, the same level of income that I was, was getting from, you know, trying to sell, you know, dial laundry soap and, you know, whatever it was. Um, but so then, from this, I kind of, I felt uh, more and more an interest in dedicating my time and life to practice. And with the support of my wife, which I'm unbelievably grateful for, um, stepped back from uh, a business life and ended up uh, spending more and more time going to Johannes Hof. Uh, Baker, she wanted me to come there. The group in Vienna invited me to teach. So there were more and more invitations for me to come to Europe and to join him there. And uh, at the same time, it's in these you know these these wonderful coincidences. This, well, this is not so wonderful. My closest friend, who was German, died, and he had a very complicated estate. And I was a successor trustee of that estate. And uh, I met with his widow several weeks after. And I had a chance to meet him just before he died in a clinic in Dortmund, which was a great gift to me that I could be with him. (sighs) Anyway, so uh, the estate was complicated enough with assets in Germany, Switzerland, South America and the United States, that she needed help. And so I came up with a suggestion about what she could do. And she looked at it. She said, I can't do this. You have to do this for me. So it ended up for about 12 years, I managed that estate. And it provided uh, a support for me on a monthly basis to dedicate my time to practice, in which she totally supported. Mm. Uh, she not just financially supported, but she, in her own practice life and the importance of practice in her life, supported my being at Johannesov. 
So it wasn't like, why are you off doing this thing? It's like, off doing this thing is making the trust a better trust, more real and uh, important for what she believed the trust should be in the world. And there was a great philanthropic aspect to the trust, which was wonderful. Mm. So I somehow found this situation where, and I managed the managers of the different asset classes. I wasn't on, you know, with when the market opened in the day trading stocks. I didn't do any of that. I just met with the managers of different asset classes and uh, managers of different properties and learned a lot, learned a whole lot, and was able to uh, help her and the estate, which was great. So this provided a way for me to be... Uh, at Johanneshof with not, without needing income from teaching or support from the Sangha. So it was a, it was a great gift to me, benefit to me. And so it, it allowed me to, uh, to dedicate myself full-time to practice, which from I, I received a show from Baker Roshi in 1999, and pretty much since that time, 2000, 2001, I've been uh, engaged in practice uh, at, at Johannes Hof. Hmm. And divide my time between there and we, my wife and I live in San Anselmo, which you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it's a great gift to me to be able to... Uh, develop a practice and as I am capable and able to share the practice with others. It's a great gift. Mm. That is that is well said, all of it. Do you do you um is do you have anything to add? <laughs> I don't know quite. I didn't know well, quite what to for, say. That was today. so. That was such a, a nice package, you know. Well, so then I think that why why mess with a nice package? Uh huh. Um. <laughs> so yeah, that's all very interesting. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, hmm. And I look forward to when we meet again. <laughs> Whenever that oh, is. Oh, David, I would be, I'd be so grateful. And I, I don't know what kind of, what, I mean, what you do with this. But uh, I, uh, I, I continue, not just appreciate, but I continue to want to support what you do uh, as a way to uh, be a conduit for different aspects of our sangha and to provide a way for uh, people to continue to connect with Susie Grish's teaching. So I'm very grateful to you, David, dear David. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, yeah, Suzuki Roshi's teaching, but also just as much what what the various people who pass through there have to say, like you. <laughs> uh, well, I, really I, I feel, yeah, I feel uh, because I've had you know, I've had the rough patches in my practice. And what's uh, allowed me, given me the uh, the directionality in my practice is my sense of my continuing to practice with him. And mm-hmm. it's been, it's been uh, unbelievable source of uh, uh, support and encouragement for me the relationship I've had with him, which I which is true of so many of us. I mean, I don't mean to make this... Yeah, me too. Um, really? I uh, would... You know, uh, we wouldn't be here without him. Uh, I don't know what would be here. Abs- David, absol- absolutely. Uh, you know, Mike Dixon thinks mm, there wouldn't have been a Zen Center. He doesn't think it would have survived. I don't know if that's, that's impossible to say. Something else would have happened. Somebody else, something else would have filled in the gap. But 
Good Lord. Uh, you know, Suzuki Roshi needed, uh, he just made things possible, but he couldn't do them, you know. It wasn't his country, and and that wasn't his role. Uh, yeah. But, um, good Lord, uh, I was I was around uh, Richard a uh, lot back then uh, in 66, 67, and I watched him really closely, and I watched how he related to Suzuki Roshi, and that was very helpful to me uh, because he was just himself, you know? He wasn't being obsequious or... He was just being him. And um, that's the way I always like to be. But and, and David, if I, if I may say, he yeah. still is that way. I mean, I speak to him not every day, but maybe several times a week. Mm -hmm. And he still holds Suzuki Roshi as his teacher, as our teacher yeah. in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whatever people make, and I, my feeling, and again, you've been so wonderful in uh, being uh, in, in listening to to all the sides of a complex situation. My feeling is always from him. What I've heard is the reference point is his commitment to practice with his mm -hmm. and this is where, in spite of the differences that I've had with him, and I've had differences with him. Uh, he, he basically says, we've never disagreed. He said, we've had differences of opinion. Sometimes I think we disagreed. <laughs> uh -huh. but, uh -huh. but he says, no, 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 we never disagreed. And where uh -huh. I feel we've never disagreed uh -huh. is in, in the commitment as best we're able with all our limitations to find a way to honor and support the practices that Zikoshi has fostered in us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I have remained in touch with them, you know, through the years and even recently and uh, look forward to the next time. And, you know, of course, I'm thinking uh, 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 how to approach him about doing uh, one or more podcasts. It's not his style, you know, uh, I don't think, but... Uh, I don't know. He might do it. Well, we can all change, you know. <laughs> I don't know what practice is. Yeah. And he's been, we've done these online teachings, which I know you're aware of. I and I went, I, I, I uh, you know, Tuesday. Uh, he's still doing those? He's done now a series, and at the end of the series, I really felt him being comfortable in this situation. At the beginning, he was, and it made me uncomfortable, and I've told him how uncomfortable he felt. I could feel how uncomfortable he felt. Uh -huh, but he found his place there. I, I, I attended yeah. one of them. It's, it, uh, it's really a bad time for me, and I kept intending to, uh, to it, for me, it was like Tuesday at 6 p.m. What, like 2 in the morning or something? No, no, 6 p.m. or something. It wasn't oh. a bad time, but Tuesday was a bad day for me. It's it's not now, though, uh, because of uh, the podcasts. Um, I'm, I'm reading uh, Crooked Cucumber and commenting on it, and Tuesday's the day that it went up. And, you know, when I first did it, it was just, like, very, very time-consuming and figuring things out and working with them and this and that. And now I'm doing six a week. And wow. it's going much quicker. Well, David, where can I where can I listen to these podcasts at Cuke.com? Uh, just go to Cuke.com right there on the home page, uh, right up top. It says Cuke Audio Podcasts, and it's uh, Cuke Cuke Audio Podbean. They're also on Spotify and uh, iTunes. New Cuke Audio Podcasts on Podbean. Podbean. Whoa. Podbean. Podbean. Yeah, it's the uh, host. It's the host. Oh, Podbean, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, I'm there now. Yeah. Chat with Mel Weitzman. There's a wonderful picture of Cuke Audio, David Follow. 
Remedy Life in Bali. Wonderful. Okay, thank yeah. you for telling me. Yeah, Life in Bali is Thursdays. And see, when I first started off, I was doing one week, it was like a variety show. And, you know, I'd start reading Quirky Cucumber after about 30 minutes uh, and then put comments in. And, and then uh, sometimes the comments would be longer than the chapter. And so it would be the next week would be the comments. And then uh, finally I upped my... Uh, my uh, account with Podbean to where I could do it every uh, every day and um, so uh, what I do now is uh, Crooked Cucumber and Comments on it are Tuesday, Thursday's Life in Bali so I can get all the nonsense, nonsense in there. But David, you look I'm looking at your picture and it's small, it's a little square, but you you've you re- with Katrinka, you have really trimmed down, David. Oh yeah, I weigh a lot less than I used to. <laughs> uh, oh my! S- Saturdays are the phone chats. They're the the Zen Cuke Archives related phone chats. So there's been uh, uh, this Saturday, uh, Vanya is going up. <laughs> that is great, man. Oh nice. <laughs> um, and uh, I think last Saturday was Mel, and the one before that was, uh, there's been Ed Brown, Paul Shippey. Now, before I started having the day set aside, uh, Peter Schneider was in two of them. Uh, 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 Mel Weitzman was in two of them. Paul Disco was briefly there. Uh, but I'm I'm going to talk to Peter uh, a week from today at 7, and him and Jane, and I'm going to get back to Paul. Uh, and, um, uh, oh, I did a really long one with uh, uh, Danny Barker, who's Ed Brown's uh, uh, Dharma heir. Just a fascinating guy. I don't know him. No, no, you wouldn't know him. Um, he, I'm looking at your Cuke audio podcast photograph, and I'm looking at Dan and Louise and Ed and Paul and Stan White and Chino Roshi and Harriet. I mean, all these people. It's amazing. That's 1967 in the fall. Uh, af- it's the it's the after the first practice period, and uh, I got to redo that. I got to re retrim that for Podbean because it cuts off the bottom two rows. I, I can see. Yeah, I can't see them so well. Yeah, you can see the top of my head there. And Bob Hal and Bob Halpern. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, it's um, fantastic. Yeah. Uh yeah, I've got to do that. You know, I've got a thousand, you know, notes thousand things to get to and Craig boy Craig Boyan with lots of hair uh, was Craig there then yeah he was next to Chris Flynn it looks like and next to Kogan Chino and next me, to Tim Buckley up. let me go up all right just a second next all to right. Harriet all right yeah of course uh, people had a lot of hair back then they did uh, oh, uh, that's interesting. What was yesterday? Yesterday was, you said oh, scrubbing? you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I do mini podcasts. They just take me a few minutes to do, like 15 minutes total. And what I do there is read Zen is right here. Uh, just a vignette from it. You know, the little book of vignettes yes. uh, about Suzuki Roshi. Uh, and so I just read one of them and make some comment on it. And so that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And incidentally, there's the sequel to it coming out next year, uh, 2021, in July. And the uh, 50th anniversary issue of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, just came out with uh, a new afterword by me. I did the 40th. 
How did you pick this picture? What, it's Larry, and is that Emmy Bragdon? How do you remember Larry? Larry Weisberg, Larry Weiss. How do you remember that? Because I remember him. He wasn't there very long, was he? I, it was long enough for me to remember him. Wow. You know, I just learned his name. Yeah, Larry White, not Weisberg, something like that. People, we've been wondering what his name was. I, I thought it was Larry, but that's all I knew. Larry came to my mind. Yeah. And I remembered him, but I didn't remember how long he'd been there or anything. I think he was just there for a while or that summer or whatever. And that was like... Probably 60, well, 68, 69. Yeah, because and, I came in 68, so it couldn't have been before that. And right. Is that Emmy Bragdon behind him? That is. That is. Good eye. Uh, and who's the guy with the glasses, though? Uh, I think his name might be Jim. I'd, I'd love to know. I've th That is one of the most used photographs of Suzuki Roshi. Huh. It's just used over and over, and I've had people ask me. Uh, a professor at the uh, uh, University of San Francisco I've had some involvement with, whose name is John Nelson, not to be confused with our dear Ooh. late friend John Nelson. D John Nelson is late? Yeah, yeah, he died, oh, I don't know, not long ago, months ago. I didn't know that. Half a year less. Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, my. You just write his name in the site search box on Cuke, and you can read about it. Um, oh. But, uh, yeah, yeah, sad. Because he was so youthful. I mean, this is the sort of person you'd think was, was just, just still in middle age, you know. And <laughs> uh, uh, Yeah, but, um, yes, we lost him. Um USF wrote me about it. I don't know why, but so many people wanted to know, and I didn't know. And then, like, I don't know, six months ago or something, Alan Winter, sent me, who who I'm in periodic touch with, and I'm, he's got to be in one of these podcasts because he's so interesting and has such he an interesting, interesting. Uh, life uh, and his own definite point of view on things. Anyway... Uh, Alan Winter sent me an email saying, hey, I know who that guy is. I I ran into that picture in this book called, I think it's called Hippie Chick. Um, I don't know. And uh, uh, there was that picture. And it was the, the woman uh, who wrote Hippie Chick married him. And <laughs> his name, so, and... Um, uh, you know, Paul got his name, you know, out of the book. And then he said, you you can contact her. She's on Facebook. So I got in touch with her. And so I have a whole page on or something on on that picture and with a picture of her book and, you know, that whole story of finding out what his name was. But that was just recently. And then to have you... Come remember his name like that is really amazing. Uh, Larry, well, it's W. Larry. Yeah. Well, I can I can tell you. Actually, she told me he's changed his last name, so his name back then. And uh, I said, well, what did he change his name when she said Larry so and so back then? And she said yes. So I didn't ask further. But. Um, Anyway, she lives in Jenner now, and um, <laughs> um, but there's nothing else in the book about Zen, Center, or Tassahara. It was just she happened to have been married to that guy, and he's living in, I think, in uh, Ashland, Oregon now, and is in his 80s. And um, I've I've sent him. Uh, well, no, two different people have sent him emails asking him if uh, I could talk to him, and I haven't, you know, he hadn't gotten back to me, so. Interesting. No, I don't think he was at Zen Center for very long. Yeah, that, that is really cool. You remember that. Uh, 
I, huh. I just I, and he, I remember a sweetness to him. Mm. A maturity and a sweetness. Wow. Wish I could remember what I had for breakfast. Uh-huh. <laughs> I actually do remember what I had for breakfast day. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. But uh yeah, the way these things happen, I don't know. Huh. Wow. But it's, so it's so sweet what you're doing. Well, uh keeps me out of trouble. Uh, uh I'm doing as much of it as I can now while Katrinka's stuck in America. Uh, oh, I didn't know this. Yeah, she she's she left March 17th, and, you know, this place closed down. The airport closed in April, and she was planning on coming back on the 27th, and then she kept making reservations. They canceled them. And, uh, so she's, she's trying to get back in July now. Uh, but, you know, the virus here uh, uh, stupefied epidemiologists who thought Bali would be a hot spot because of all the... I mean, we had all these Chinese from Wuhan coming in, in even in March. And an uh, enormous number of Chinese tourists here, uh, and, which was a bit of a mistake on Indonesia's part because they don't... They, they go to... Chinese hotels, you know, hotels owned by Chinese on tour buses owned by Chinese in eat and restaurants owned by Chinese, and not local Chinese, you know. So, and and they don't, uh, local people don't see anything from them much. I mean, there's some, but mm-hmm. um, so uh, that's one reason I, I realized that we didn't get a lot of virus from the Chinese is they weren't they weren't mixing with anybody. They were just staying with themselves, going and looking at important sites and seeing this and yeah. that. Dances set up just for them and then leaving. Uh, but it's starting to pick up now. Uh, now there's over a thousand uh, people have tested positive uh, from the yeah. night markets. But listen, you hear every... Uh, tourism is 85 percent of the um, uh, of the economy of Bali, and uh, this place you you can't get in unless you have a residential visa, which we have. So she, Katrinka can get in, but she's got to get a flight, and you know even other Indonesians can't come here without some good reason. Uh, and you, you've got to wear a mask when you go out. And like when somebody in the market, uh, in the night market where it was spreading, you know, when they, when somebody, uh, you know, gets it, tests positive, they go testing everybody they can. Uh, I think it's going to be hard to stop it from spreading, though, because Balinese people are just, they're so, uh, you know, they'll, they'll do what they're, told them what they're expected when they're in public but as soon as nobody's watching they'll just take off their masks and <laughs> I've seen that you know I, I don't know if you if you knew but we were in China we left on January 6th <laughs> really we got out just in time but we were in Beijing and then we were in Yunnan because you, my love of tea ah. I, I wanted to go to Yunnan province and have some pu'er oh, David I'm a fanatic Ha, ha, ha. I it's get where it's like you know can I can I afford it? But um, I love puerto. Hey, Paul, my yes. my our best friends in in Kuala Lumpur are engaged Buddhists, and uh, Vidya I know him through Alan Sanaka, you know, who's like Mister Engaged Buddhism, oh, yeah, Buddhist yeah, yeah. Peace Fellowship, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're wonderful people. We've stayed with them. They started a Buddhist school. Uh, we've stayed in their school. And Vidya, uh, uh, who, you know, will go to to uh, Myanmar to talk with the violent Buddhists there and to Thailand to talk to the violent Buddhists there and to Sri Lanka to talk to the violent Buddhist monks there. Um, his father has a beware collection that Vidya said is probably worth around $200,000. Uh, 
And so whenever I'm there, they're giving, they give us pu'er to take with us, but it's just constantly when we're with them being served pu'er if we want it. And I do. I'm sorry. I'm a tea freak. I don't oh, drink it's coffee. crazy. Yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> so well, We uh, had a chance. We went to two tea ceremonies. Uh, and I bought some tea, and you know, and they were, you know, and and Gene and I kind of looked at each other, and we said, we can't do this. And Gene said, you have to. <laughs> and I bought some very good tea, and you know, the amount that you drink of it, you know, and I get eight, ten infusions from a small amount of tea. That's right. Um, that's right. It's love, really something. I love the tea. I mean, it's just. You know, when I do gung fu stuff, I mean, I do the whole thing. I mean, I just love it. So why it's my, this is my vice. What were you saying? You do gung what? Gung fu? Hmm? You said when you do gung fu? Yeah, the gung fu tea ceremony. You know, the I make it with a um, uh, a gaiwan. I, I don't know any of these words. I mean, oh, anyway, it's, you know, the, the tea serving vessel. Mm-hmm. And the small cups and the bamboo tea tray and the, yeah, so I, it, I do a, 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 it's like, you know, Japanese tea ceremony. Mm-hmm. I'm not trained, but I'm inspired. So I do Chinese gung fu, it's called gung fu style, with these gai wands where you uh, pour off the water in the tea and pour it over the cups and so uh, Anyway, so I'm just, I, but I, I love the tea. The complexity of the tea, the richness of the tea, uh, it's just, it's a joy for me. So I have some, I have some, I don't think as good as, clearly, this kind of collection, but I have, I, I have a couple of nice teas that I enjoy. Um, uh, Kelly, uh, you know, my eldest son uh, has been a very serious mycologist. Uh, but he, and was he in the wine business? Maybe I'm He was wrong. in the wine business for many years and uh, yeah. was okay. very, uh, you know, he was like, uh, they, they wanted him to be the biggest distributor in the country. He wanted him to be head of the whole West Coast. He wouldn't do it. He likes uh, being in Spokane. He finally, I don't know, about five years ago, he decided that's enough of that and started a tree trimming business. And now he's got, you know, like 10 employees and a bunch of trucks and a uh, bunch of jobs going on. It's an essential uh, business. So, oh. And he's a real nature boy, so he's a lot happier. But, um, his, uh, you know, he's, he's been seriously into mushrooms uh, actually all his life and uh, had his own lab and everything and was the president of the local Mushroom Society and set up conferences and has taught it in college, even though he didn't go to college. Uh, and um, he, there's a guy who wrote Mushrooms Demystified, who's very well known in the mushroom world, and he has land in Mendocino. And Kelly was going down for a weekend with him of forays and so uh, Clay, my younger son, and Katrinka and I met them there. And we went for a foray with them and picked mushrooms with a group of about, you know, eight, maybe five other people, six, maybe six other people, six, seven other people. And then we came back. But before we went out, they, he, he brought out... Um, uh, Pu'er from China and started talking about uh, Pu'er. Uh, and um, he talked about discs of Pu'er that were selling for $10,000. Uh, <laughs> so he had some really good Pu'er. We all drank Pu'er. We went out. Then we came back and we ate nothing but mushrooms. And Kelly told me there wasn't a single mushroom we were eating that wasn't classified as poisonous. Really? Yeah, he said, um, you know, that's before they get cooked. You cook away the poison. Um, he said, however, this one that you're eating right now, 
He said, that one's pretty iffy. I don't know about it. I'd like to point out here that you can't take just any old poisonous mushroom and cook it and eat it unless you're looking for a way to kill yourself. It's just with these mushroom experts, these particular mushrooms we were eating, I have no idea what the names of any of them were, could be cooked and eaten, even though they were classified as poisonous. Don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> My God, man, I was terrified. And I remember driving home, you know, several hours from Mendocino. I was a little bit high. It's sort of nice, you know, sort of clear and this, mm. oh, there's something I, <laughs> anyway, well, we David went, Aurora we... is his name, David uh -huh. Aurora, but we... yeah, most people don't know about Pu'er. Well, it's just when, when we went to Beijing, uh, we, we had arranged with a, a guide to go to a tea ceremony. And the usual Chinese trip is, you know, that you get tea and then they sell. No selling. Mm. Nothing to sell. And but when we went to Kunming, which is in Yunnan, which is where these where the poor trees are, uh, we went to tea ceremonies, and then they did sell. And basically, they kind of escalated. And then they got to the point that they said, these Chinese people don't drink these. We send these to Hong Kong. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and, you know, you can, and you can tell. I mean, at a certain point, you can tell. But I, I'm drinking a, a relatively pedestrian, a 1999 brick from, um, from Mocha from Manghai, which is as good as I've ever had. And it's very affordable, very, and delicious, and just, it's such a pleasure. It's such a, uh, Okakura Kazuko, the guy who wrote Book of Tea, mm -hmm. talked about tea as a cup of humanity. And my feeling is when I make the tea in this way, and because each infusion is different, and I can push the tea, or I'm learning how to make the tea in, in different ways, to bring out different qualities of the tea, which is not true of Japanese tea as much. So there's more individuality in the growing of the Chinese tea than the Japanese mm. tea and the trees that it comes from. But, you know, for me to have this tea each day, I mean, I feel so blessed, so fortunate. And, and this the, the brick I'm drinking from now is just... <laughs> delightful. So so delightful. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, oh, dear David. Well, it's a pleasure speaking with you. This is uh, rambling. Anyway, <clears throat> a pleasure being with you this it's, evening. It's it's all good. It's all good. It's all yeah. good. It was good to ramble with you a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great to speak with you. Um, I I. Uh, yeah, I am uplifted and and will venture into the day f uh, full of bright spirit. <laughs> Thanks to your presence here with me. Thank well, you. Well, as it much. as it may be, dear David, thank you for all that you do, for who you are and what you do. Well, much you're love welcome. To you. The feelings mutual, and um, give my love to meine Freunde in. Uh, Mine in Freunden, in, uh, in, in uh, right? In, yeah, that's in, correct. It's pretty in, good. Uh, in Deutschland, at the uh, Schwarzwald. <laughs> There's your, and, your room is still available, David. Ooh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You stayed All in right. room 13. Yeah, I liked it. I liked that building. I like I mean, the other building, I was, I was very supportive. A Baker Roshi getting that other building. I wrote something to, you know, I sent it to um, Nicole to send to people. Oh, good. Uh, about it when when he was, it was it was just you know it's just like getting Green Gulch. Everybody was against getting Green Gulch. I don't know if you remember that. 
uh, all the board members were against getting Green Gulch. And he just forced them to get it. <laughs> it was the same thing in Germany, I mean. Well, this was, yeah, we had to get into another whole other discussion, but I am so grateful. I think it was, I, I described the development of our practice as four turnings. Uh-huh. And this was the third turning. Wow. Which chained us, changed us from uh, a seminar house to uh, a residential center with a monastic component. Yeah, yeah. It's a big change. It's great. It's great. Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, dear David, much love to yeah, you. Yeah, you too. Thank you for spending some time with me. This was sweet. Yeah, it was great. Thanks a lot. And give my love to Jean. And, uh, and I hope you see Katrinka soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're we're in Dutch quite a bit, and um, uh, she will be back, and then it will be as if we were never apart. I hope so. <laughs> May it be so. Okay. Much love, you. Too. You too. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> So thank you very much, Paul Rosenblum. Really good. So that brings us to the conclusion of today's phone chat. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back with another phone chat next Saturday which you can listen to any time, but you won't be able to listen to it before next Saturday. So until then, this is DC in Sleepy Sanur with Dog at Bandita and feline Kuchita, but without dear, lovely Katrinka. Wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Mm -hmm.